thank you all very much indeed for coming along to this uh, important and interesting session on... I spend my entire life, I'm a political journalist, all I think about is Brexit. So talking about it on a sunny Sunday afternoon does not seem remotely unusual to me, but thank you all for giving up your sunny Sunday afternoon to join us in this discussion. We've got a brilliant panel, and if it's OK with all of you, what we're going to do is I'll introduce the panel. We'll have a discussion about the two themes we've been set, two themes, Brexit and its overall impact in the UK and Brexit and its impact on Scotland. We'll explore both and then open it out for a wider conversation. Uh, the panel, for those of you from the UK, and I know some of you probably aren't, John Curtis needs no introduction whatsoever. He's the person who presides, amongst many other things, over the exit poll at general elections. We've just been talking about the last one in 2017, um, where John Curtis revealed against the expectations of many, but not, he tells me himself, <laughs> that Theresa May was not going to win an overall majority, a moment some of us are still reflecting on. Um, Bonnie Greer is a writer, a commentator, a broadcaster. She's already spoken on a whole range of things in the festival. She's also become a regular contributor to the newspaper which emerged during the referendum campaign, The New European, which is a paper which was set up basically during the referendum. And unlike most newspapers which close, has continued... Um, and I think it's published, is it weekly now? Yes, uh, yeah, every and, week. and she writes some brilliant columns putting all kinds of different arguments against Brexit. Lord Karam uh, Bilamoria is a crossbencher in the House of Lords, uh, founder and still chair of COBRA, um, and is a very successful entrepreneur, could bring a business perspective and other perspectives to the whole Brexit debate. I have to say, you too are opposed to Brexit, aren't you? As are most people, I suspect, in this room. <laughs> so in, for this balance alone, for the next hour of my life, I'm going to be in the unique <laughs> position of constantly putting the case for Brexit, which will be an interesting experience. <laughs> Before um, anything else, John Curtis is the person to put all this into context. So, John, before we explore what is happening, why it's happening and what's likely to happen, mm -hmm. has public opinion in the UK as a whole changed significantly since the referendum? I'm going to give you that academic answer of define significantly. Um, <laughs> broadly speaking, we divided pretty much down the middle on June the 23rd, 2016. And the truth is that we're still, broadly speaking, still divided roughly down the middle. It's possibly true that maybe we have moved very, very slightly in the Remain direction. And of course, given that the outcome last time was very, very close, I certainly wouldn't want to put too much money on assuming that the winner in a referendum held now would be exactly the same as it was 12 months ago. But it was, certainly would be very, very tight. I mean, it, it, YouGov, for example, have been running this time series um, ever since August of last year, saying to people, in hindsight, do you think that uh, the decision to uh, leave the European Union is right, right or wrong? Most of the time, it's had a slight majority in favour of right, but more recently, it's occasionally had the majority for wrong. Stroke, it's been 50-50. But it's, you know, the truth is that then, as with opinion polls, there's some polls that have a majority for May and some that have a majority for Leave, you know, plus ça change, plus ça même shows. Um, but I think maybe we've shifted very slightly, but not, not significantly in the sense of lots of people, maybe significantly in terms of what the outcome might have been if it were in the referendum now. As I've already mentioned, you guided us through the drama of the election night when Theresa May sought a mandate for her Brexit, didn't get it, lost her overall majority. Mm -hmm. In your view, as a professor of politics as well as a sophologist, mm -hmm. does that change the whole argument about legitimacy? Does this newly elected House of Commons and House of Lords um, now have the space legitimately to challenge and oppose because she didn't get a mandate in the form of a landslide that she 
sought and perhaps expected? Well, you have to remember that I'm not the world's largest fan of the single member plurality electoral system. And that even if Theresa May had achieved her original ambition, she may have only won, let us say, 45, 46 or 47 percent of the vote. And the crucial difference between a referendum and a general election is you can only win a referendum by getting the votes of at least a half of the people who turn out to vote, whereas you actually you can win a parliamentary landslide with considerably less than 50 percent of the vote. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Uh, in the first place, whether or not, you know, in practice, um, a conservative success would have indicated that we definitely wanted a hard Brexit. What, of course, is true about the election is that, on the one hand, those people who voted to leave tended to drift towards the Conservative Party, not least those who were voted for UKIP in 2015. Those who voted to remain dis drifted disproportionately towards Labour. And it does therefore mean that our two principal parties, who of course both came to dominate um, uh, the electoral outcome in a way that previously hadn't happened since, the, uh, since 1970, um, the Conservative does have a predominantly pro-Leave electorate. The Labour Party does have a disproportionately pro-Remain electorate. And therefore, they have become perhaps rather more effective vehicles for continuing the debate about the shape of Brexit than they might have probably have been before June the 8th. Now, I'm not quite sure that was Theresa May's intention, uh, but perhaps that is what's really happened, is then that therefore, to that extent at least, um, the parliamentary battle between Conservative and Labour is going to provide a forum in which that debate does continue in some relatively organised way. And of course Labour has clarified or perhaps changed its position today and we'll explore that in, in a moment. But Lord Billimori, if I could ask you, when you now have conversations with peers, and I've had some with pro-European Tory peers, who now feel it is entirely valid and legitimate that for them to be much more robust in their opposition to Brexit post the election. Have you had those kind of conversations as someone who is very worried about some elements of Brexit? There's no question that after the uh, disastrous, uh, Theresa May's disastrous election, uh, it has given people a voice. Because what has happened is the strangest, we're talking about what form of democracy you have, uh, we've had very few referenda in this country ever. And there's a reason for it. We should never have them. Because yeah. referenda are, are an absolutely useless in the form of representative democracy and in our parliamentary democracy that we have. Secondly, if you're going to have a referendum on such an important topic, you don't have it on a 50.1% and you win, and you're locked in and generations are locked in forever. This is nonsense. Any country that has a written constitution, I don't say for one minute that we should have a written constitution, but countries that have a written constitution, whether it's the United States, whether it's India, if you want to change that written constitution, you need a two-thirds majority. And there's a very sensible reason for that, that you don't make these decisions on a 50.1 or a 52.48 basis. So that's one thing. I think we got it badly wrong. And I, as a parliamentarian, have to take responsibility for it because none of us took this seriously and just said, oh, you want a referendum, let's get it out of the way. Nobody ever thought we'd be in this position. So now people have a voice. In Parliament, I've seen it, people are speaking out. Conservatives who were scared are speaking out, but people, unfortunately, in the country at the moment are still, and I think it's a very decent thing about this country, we're very decent as a country, we feel, oh my God, there's the will of the people, we had a democratic vote, we can't, we have to see it through. We've got to execute the will of the people. Hang on, there was a will of the people a year ago. We're already a year down the road. And the real respect of the will of the people will be, well, you voted to leave, but you didn't vote to leave on what basis? So if you really respect the will of the people, when and if there is a deal, you go to the people and say, are you now happy to leave on this basis? Call it referendum part B. Call it a second referendum. Call it what you want. That is respecting the will of the people. But isn't that wholly contradictory to say we shouldn't hold referendums and we must have a second one? I mean, isn't that... The, and, and, and more specifically, isn't there a real danger if there is a second one? Much of the debate will be taken up about whether or not there should be a second one. And the whole thing gets into a complete mess again. And... Um, so, 
Yes, so my, my view on this is, uh, and I was the first person uh, in Parliament, to my knowledge, after the election, I spoke in the Queen's speech debate, literally, straight after the Queen's speech, uh, and I said in my speech, I actually don't think Brexit will happen, uh, for, for a number of reasons, and we can discuss that in due course, but yeah. I want to make one thing very clear. I, I'm pretty much a Eurosceptic in many ways as well. I don't think the way the European Parliament works, I don't know about you, I don't know who my MEP is. MEPs are. I don't know anyone who knows who the MEPs are. The link between MEPs and their constituencies is pretty weak. It's not accountable. It's not representative. Um, I used to think we should be in Schengen because we were losing out on business and tourist visas, visitors. Now we're lucky not to be in Schengen from a security point of view, from a migration crisis point of view. Um, thank God we didn't join the euro. We've got control over our own interest rates and our own economy. So in many ways, we've actually, and this Boris Johnson fellow, talking about, have my cake and eat it too. We've had our cake and we've been eating it. You know, I pour Cobra beer in pints when I want to. I sell it in liters on the shelves when I want to. I, if we drive our cars, we fill our petrol in liters. We measure our roads in miles. We drive on the left-hand side of the road. We have had our sovereignty. We've had the best of both worlds. Bonnie, Bonnie obviously you want this overturned as well. But in arguing about the purity of a referendum and so on, and obviously it's absurd, these binary questions, but if Remain had won um, and we had Farage and others calling for a second referendum, we would be saying it's outrageous and so on, wouldn't we? I mean, it is deeply subjective when people welcome referendums and when they do not. And if Remain had won, I suspect a debate on the purity of referendums would not be being staged here now? Well, uh, not for, not for my, my part. I mean, I agree. Um, well, let me just go back from how, where I write from in, in relation to the paper. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, the paper began as a pop-up, and that means it was only supposed to last during the referendum, and it's now over a year old. And it went from a, what's called a Berliner, which is the way the observer looks, which is, is a shape. And now it's a tabloid shape. And it's for the newsstand so that you see it. And when you go, and it comes out on Thursdays. Um, it's very much a, a tabloid in the sense that there are articles that range from the scurrilous, the funny, to thoughtful pieces. There are cartoons. There are art pieces. But everything that's dedicated uh, in the paper is toward thinking about where we are and who we are and being pro-remain. Um, and so my approach to the pieces that I write are as an immigrant because that's what I am. Um, I've lived here half my life, but I am an immigrant and I'm very proud to be an immigrant. Uh, I don't have the, the emotional connection to this United Kingdom, to this country, to 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 the nations of this of this island, as the rest of you do, so I can actually see the emotional connection much more clearly. So I try to write from looking at, let's say, the emotional, and really what you were talking about, Karim, and and and, and what has been talked about which is, I guess, I don't want to use the word rational because I don't want to use the word irrational, but to separate out emotional patriotism and patriot, patrioticness to some kind of legal and, and, and technical thing. And, and from my point of view, and I think the, pay, well, my point of view, I can only talk about my point of view, there are a couple of things. Um, I, I tweet a lot. I get a lot, do a lot on social media, and I get people using terms like the, the will of the people. Now, I can only say this as an immigrant, and from my point of view, the only thing that exists as the will of the people is the royal family. That exists as the will of the people. And in fact, technically, uh, what happened that you know, Princess Charlotte is able to be third in line because the government as elected through the people, decided that she was going to be in the line of succession. The royal family exists by the will of the people, and they're absolutely clear about that. Everything else exists through parliament as the people in parliament. There is nothing outside of parliament. That is what we decided. That was what well, you decided, what you fought for, what your ancestors fought for, was for a parliament. So to have a referendum, which is actually opening it up to whatever sort of, 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 of kind of uh, 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 
well, it's like the Great Bake Off or, or like Britain's Got Talent, is not what this country what this nation set out and set up to do. And I know Gina Miller very well, and the reason she went to court, the reason she went to court was to establish that Parliament had the decision on this, not Her Majesty's government, which is the Crown. And the fact that so many people don't see the difference between that and understand what it is and why this question brings up how this country is constructed is where I do my writing from. And it's part exploration. And it's, an, and it's an immigrant looking and saying, hey, guys, but this is what you voted for. You voted for parliament. You voted for your parliament to have a voice. You voted for your parliament to make decisions and not Her Majesty's government, which is the crown. And so for me, if the, P if the parliament decides that there should be another referendum or another think through, that is the will of the people because that is your parliament. Um, and just very briefly, because uh, I want to bring the others, we've got to discuss Scotland as well. Mm -hmm. uh, would you be okay if there wasn't a referendum, it was just parliament who defeated the deal on the basis that parliamentary sovereignty should solve this, not some or, uh, another plebiscite or something? 100%. Like that. yeah. Okay, that's very clear. Um, well, can just one thing. Uh, yeah. One of the reasons, main reasons we had this election just now is because the Prime Minister was trying to bypass Parliament and issue Article 50 without consulting Parliament. I think that's absolutely shocking. Your representatives. Yeah. That is so bad. Your representatives. And when Parliament was consulted, we in the House of Lords, we had two of the biggest votes ever in the House of Lords, 634 and 614, and we resoundingly defeated the government by 100 votes each time. That is why she got so scared and called this election, and look where it's got her. John Curtis, I mean, the alternative view of this, someone relatively measured, well, very measured, actually, and very <laughs> cautious. Not, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the person I'm going to quote to you, uh, Ed Miliband, in an interview with me. He well, he's measured. I he mean, and measured. arguably too cautious in some respects, as he certainly thinks so retrospectively. Um, uh, said to me that if the outcome of that referendum was reversed, there would be riots in the streets. He represents Doncaster, which was a huge remain a, a Brexit majority. So, how is this conundrum to be resolved? It's clear that if you speak privately to MPs, and we'll talk about the way Labour has shifted today, there is no majority in Parliament, certainly not the Lords, you've made that clear, sure. and in the Commons, sure. for almost certainly the kind of Brexit that this government is seeking. So what prevails? The fear of undoing a people's verdict or Bonnie's vision of, of, of Parliament? What, what do you sense is going to happen in that? Um, well, the truth is, with the question that we are now faced with is whether or not this minority Conservative government will or will not manage to cohere together with its associated parliamentary party. If it manages to cohere, i.e. if the cabinet actually manages to agree what position it is adopting vis-a-vis -vis the <laughs> European Union, yeah. and if indeed it brings at least 95% of the Conservative parliamentary party with it, then given that there will be some Labour MPs such as Frank Field who will back the government over Brexit, it might still have a parliamentary majority. Clearly, however, at least the potential nightmare that's facing this government is, first of all, that indeed, as a minority government, which doesn't necessarily have the wholehearted support of its parliamentary party on the issue of Brexit, that it starts losing significant votes over the Great Repeal Bill. But then more seriously, that actually the EU negotiations do not go well and that the vision that the government is putting forward of getting out of the single market, getting out of the customs union, getting out of the ECJ, but then trying to have a very close uh, relationship thereafter, that it proves very difficult to deliver that. And as a result, we get a splitting cabinet. Now, that, now, I'm not saying this is what's going to happen, but this, in a sense, is as a result of the election, this is the uncertainty that's being created. Now, I think the truth is that... the now, now, in the general election, you know, Labour Party uh, 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 it was very ambiguous where it stood, but basically saying we accept the result. I think, in truth, if it's not going to happen, it's only not going to happen because, let us say, 
in the wake of a collapse of a conservative government um, in the course of the next two years, and at the same time a much bigger shift in public opinion than frankly has occurred so far, that we get a, let us say, a Labour government, or at least a minority Labour government, that is committed to holding a second referendum, and in the end we have that referendum vote the other way. That said, I think the truth is for anybody who wants us to stay inside the European Union, I think there's a, there's a crucial bit in what the Labour Party has said today. Yeah. Basically, Labour Party pay, Labour Party's long-term aspiration is basically, actually, could we stay in the single market? Could we stay in the customs union? Could we stay, we'll, we'll accept the ECJ, but what we're not willing to accept are the freedom of movement provisions of the European Union as currently constituted. And the truth is that you know, if indeed the current government were to collapse and the current negotiations were to collapse, the question that they will then face the European Union is, well, look, if you want these guys back in, you're going to have to give the UK more on immigration than you gave David Cameron in February 2016, because at the end of the day, that of all the issues that we discuss, you know, the, the issue that above all just tipped us over the top to mean that 52% of people voted to leave was the issue of immigration, that the deal that Cameron came back with dealt with that less. And it is worth remembering that the UK has been here before. Back in 1948, we effectively gave freedom of movement to all citizens of the British Empire. Right. And then That's when right. they started coming, well, the greater numbers than we found it was acceptable, from 1962 onwards, we stopped, right? And it, the truth is exactly the same story has happened here. Immigration is fine up to a point, but one needs to, I mean, the crucial thing, I mean, economists will argue that you need to have freedom of labor in the same way at the same time as freedom of capital and freedom of goods because you need all the factors of production to be equally mobile. The problem is that, f that people come with social attributes and as a result create externalities for the, uh, the host society and indeed, frankly, also the society Absolutely. that loses people that does re probably require rather more management that, or at least most people seem to think require, including many Remain voters, requires rather more management than a laissez-faire economic uh, position might lead you to uh, expect. Yeah, yeah, and just, just build on that. But immigration was one of the crucial issues in, in, in the referendum. And then you, and you, you just look at the figures. Three million people from the EU over here, and we've got 4.4% unemployment, the lowest in living memory and the highest level of employment. What would we do without these people? We'd have a labor shortage. And it's not just low skills, it's across the board. Uh, I'm Chancellor of the University of Birmingham. 30% of our academics are foreign, 20% from the EU. All top universities, Oxford, Cambridge, it's the case. City of London, European Union. Construction industry, 250,000. They're drain on the public service. Public service would collapse without them. The National Health Service and Care Sector, 130,000 from the European Union. And I could go on, quite apart from the hospitality industry, quite apart from the agriculture, so <coughs> skilled and low skilled. But here's the, the point. We have had control over immigration in the EU, and this is something that nobody knows about. There's an EU directive that states that any EU country can throw out an EU immigrant after three months if they have not got a job, sure. or if they're using benefits, or if they're not studying. Sure. We have had this right since 2004. Other countries like Belgium throw out thousands a year. I've asked in Parliament, why aren't we using this directive? We have control. Three months. Nobody, no answer. No answer at all from the government. Answer. So where they do we not have control it. over they the immigration? They can't uh, if uh, Yvette Cooper were here, say, uh, from her constituency in Yorkshire, she would say, this is great, a cosy conversation here in this, these lovely conditions. Go to my constituency. Not only are, is there anger on an emotional level about free movement, but there are practical reasons in terms of housing, which they can't get, jobs that are taken from them because they are undercut by people coming in and willing to do them at reduced rates from Eastern Europe and so on. And, 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 and she would say, unless people on the so-called liberal wing of politics address the realities of voters like hers, this debate is never going to 
to move on. So you could argue a rational case. Um, but she would say that there is evidence-based and emotion in this argument against free movement. Well, let me speak from, again, an immigrant's yeah. point of view, somebody who isn't in this. And I actually did talk to Yvette about this uh, on a train you. into Yorkshire once. Um, and she looked at me and said, oh. um, <laughs> I also spent, uh, I did, the last question time I did was uh, was in Boston, in Lynx, which is the biggest yeah. town mm -hmm. that voted yeah. out. Yeah. This is what I see, and I'm saying this with respect, and I'm saying this also as someone who is outside of all this, and I don't have the stuff that they don't talk about, is never, ever allowed to talk about in this country our people's feelings. You don't talk about feelings. And this is a referendum about what you feel, and nobody talks about it. Because people are talking about what they feel, not what they know and what they see, but what they feel. And the tabloids play, like the Express, plays on feelings. In Boston, when I was there, there was a young Polish woman who was the receptionist at the hotel that I was at. She had grown up there. She spoke with the, with the, you know, she spoke as she would. She was born there. She was Polish. She was proud to be Polish. All the people who were arguing with me on question time, these guys came out. They were bantering with her. They loved her. What, you know, what they, she was okay. It's the Poles who weren't, but she's Polish. Now, I'm not, the only thing that I'm saying is that these kind of things don't get into the discussion because Brexit is being driven by ideologues like Peter Bone, who spent his entire life wanting to be out. And I respect that. But that's an ideological position that has, which is basically damn the torpedoes, full steam ahead. And then you've got other people like this clown, Boris Johnson, who sees an opportunity. It's a retail opportunity for him, okay? <laughs> Basically, he could care less about which side this thing falls on because he's not going to be hurt. And the third thing is, if your wages are being undercut, it's the bosses who are doing it. And it would seem to me that the Labor Party would be the party that would stand up and say, that the reason people aren't getting paid decently has to do with the people who are running the businesses, and that needs to be talked about. The mm -hmm. fourth thing the Labor Party needs to say is that, and I say it, is that the average age in this country is 42 years old. That's a fact. We are lucky, we are blessed, those of us who came into this world at the time of the NHS. We're still kicking and alive, but we aren't making any babies anymore. That's a fact. Okay, so until that next generation comes on, we're gonna need help here. We're gonna need help. The Germans realize that they're, they're even older than Britain is, and that's why they've done what they've done. These are practical, rational, things that need to be discussed in a practical, rational way. And my faith as, a, as an immigrant is in the good sense, the common sense of the British people. And when it's put down on the table in a sensible way, people be, will see that Brexit is not only not workable, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. And that's my point. C could I uh, say, just on the grounds of balance, put uh, the case for Liam Fox. Again, a strange experience for, <laughs> for me personally. Um, but um, I have spoke, and then I want to bring John in about Scotland and Brexit, um, and then we'll open it up. Liam Fox has said to me and many other journalists, uh, now he's allowed out again uh, <laughs> after a period when he wasn't, I think. Um, he, however wrongly, seems to be genuinely excited about the prospects for businesses like yours. Let's get out of this sclerotic customs union with its bureaucracy and rules and backward-looking uh, orthodoxies. Uh, we could do a deal with the United States. He's an Atlanticist, he says, though. Sorry? He's an Atlanticist, though. That he, he absolutely has spent most of his life in Washington in curious circumstances. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, 
uh, but he, but he, in fairness, he, he mentioned Japan. He says uh, dying to do a yeah. deal with us. He says that it will be a sense of liberation out of this customs union for businesses like yours. So that's genuinely, I think, his feeling about how Brexit is going to turn Britain into a buoyant new kind of economy. As a business person, yeah. what is your well, my, argument against? My and response to the good doctor. Um, is <laughs> that here are the facts. With Cobra Beer, we manufacture here in the UK in Bertrand on Trent. We manufacture in two locations in Belgium. We manufacture in India, and we export to just about every European Union country. The fact that we have this free movement of goods and we're in this free trade zone is phenomenal for any business. The ability to move freely, move the goods freely for our businesses, employ the best people. I mean, our chief executive in the UK until just now was a Belgian. So we want the best talent, wherever they come from, in the European, we have access to that. Has this bureaucratic nonsense been bad for us as a country? Here's a fact. If you take the original EU countries, I'm saying before the enlargement and the Eastern European countries joined, and you say which country out of those original countries had the highest cumulative GDP growth to date, you'd probably say Germany. 62% Germany is the 35%. We've done well out of this. We've done really well. Now, 50% of our trade is in this free trade block. 50% of our trade. On top of that, we have 50 free trade agreements through the EU, which accounts to another 17% of our trade. So two thirds of our trade is already through the EU with this whole world that the good doctor wants to go out to. On top of that, the EU's just announced a free trade deal with, with Japan, which has taken years to get. Yeah. If you add that on, over 70% of... So now, we're going to risk that 70% to go after the 30%? Dream on. India. I went with the Prime Minister in the session we had in the wall garden yesterday, I made this point. Prime Minister goes to India with the good doctor. We're going to do a deal with India. And then the Prime Minister says to India, take back your overstaying Indians. <laughs> yeah? The Prime Minister has been saying when she's Home Secretary, 100,000 international students overstay in the UK. We challenged her, challenged her, challenged her. What happened this last week? The figures have come out. It's less than 5,000. She should resign, in my view, for deceiving the country in this way. And Prime Minister Narendra Modi, one of the most powerful people in the world today, the largest democracy in the world, 1.25 billion people, in her speech, I was sitting right there, two of them speaking as the host. She spoke first, he spoke second. She didn't mention international students once. She didn't mention the movement of people once. He humbly said the movement of people is really important to us, including our students. So where free trade deals are about more than tariffs or sure. duties, sure. it's about yeah. movement of people and other issues. And the Indian Commerce Minister on this visit, thanks to Dr. Liam Fox, she said, I thought we had a really close relationship with the UK. Now I realize it's just transactional. Dream on, Liam Fox, dream on. As the BBC would say this point, we asked Liam Fox to be here, but um, <laughs> unfortunately, he wasn't available. Um, John, could I ask you about Brexit in Scotland? I remember being here a year ago and speaking to those very close to Nicola Sturgeon, who were incredibly excited about the combination of Brexit and then a year ago, the collapse of the Scottish Labour Party, mm -hmm. being the perfect combination for a second referendum on independence. Um, and I have to say that I, I felt they were right to be. Um, since then, and as we sit here now, it looks as if the opposite has happened. And the prospects of Brexit propelling them towards a second re referendum, at least at this point in the sequence, seems to have faded. A, is that right? B, do you think that could change again when Brexit takes full shape, if it does? OK, I'll come, let me just very, very briefly just say, with respect to the debate you've just been happening, this, of course, is a very, very old debate. We were arguing the same point about whether or not the European Union was a free trade, pro-free trade, 
or an actually was a protectionist organisation before the 1975 referendum. Referent, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a very long-standing argument, but because, of course, the truth is the European Union does have an external barrier. It's particularly protectionist vis-a-vis its agriculture, and that is in part what the argument's about. But anyway, um, there's very little new on In fact, my, my favourite moment, I went to the UKIP conference in... <laughs> The autumn of 2015. Was well, that you, your favourite moment for the last 12 months? No, no. It was my favourite moment in the UKIP conference when, indeed, I heard somebody stand up and say, look, you know, why is it that we make it so difficult for people from the Commonwealth to come to the UK uh, as compared with people from the European Union? And again, this was exactly the argument that was going on before 1975. So, the, 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 and, and the, therefore, you know, the truth is the UK has always been a semi-detached member of the European Union, and that not least of the reasons for that is that because it does have that substantial English-speaking diaspora yes. out there, yeah. that gives us that, which gives us an alternative conception of a how it might position itself in the world, and b the truth is also that English-speaking diaspora has a cultural similarity, or at least we think it has a cultural similarity, that in the way that Europe, although Europe has come to take English as its lingua franca, doesn't actually necessarily, people think, the share. So we need to realise the UK you know, you know, is both unusual and distinct in this respect. I come back to Scotland. OK. Nicholas, I mean, you're right. Nicholas Sturgeon, on June the 24th, 2016, said a second referendum was back on the table. And I think there was an expectation, and certainly some of the opinion polls said, ah, uh -huh, uh, OK, yes, indeed. Now that perhaps what is the most obvious dramatic manifestation of the nationalist claim that Scotland, um, while it's in part of the UK, will ha can have its democratic wishes yeah. overturned, was the outcome of the EU referendum. And from, I think from a nationalist perspective, there was no better demonstration. However, the problem that the SNP faced is that somewhere between a quarter and a third of those people who voted yes in September 2014, and most of whom then went and voted for the SNP in May 2015, voted for Brexit. And the Brexit referendum, I mean, one of the things that some of us kind of slightly cheekily pointed out, not uh, both during and not, uh, not long after the referendum, is, well, if Jeremy Corbyn was disastrous in the EU referendum so far as his ability to get Labour voters to vote in favour of Remain, frankly, he was no more ineffective than Nicola Sturgeon. But Nicola Sturgeon got lots of plaudits. Jeremy Corbyn was criticised and faced a leadership challenge. But actually, in terms of the proportion of the SNP vote that voted to leave, Nicola Sturgeon was no more effective than Jeremy Corbyn, right? So therefore, yes, it is true. There are some people out there who voted no in September 2014, really committed to the European Union, and who now would vote yes. But the truth is that for most people in Scotland who are in favour of the union, their attachment to the union is a zillion times stronger than their attachment to the European Union, which even in Scotland, the modal Scottish, the modal remain no voter, their view is, well, I suppose we should be members of the European Union. People tell me it's in our interest, but it would be nice if it bossed us around very less. It's not a strong commitment. Meanwhile, on the other side of the fence, you do have some people now who say, ah, oh, well, you know, what was the point of Scotland trying to become independent if then it was going to secede its sovereignty to Brussels? And you can may want to regard them as, in some sense, true nationalists. And the truth is that, for therefore, for every person, and there aren't that many of them, who switch from no to yes uh, because of their upset about the EU, there's another group who've gone in the opposite direction because they're saying, ah, actually, if the UK has a sense to leave the European Union, then maybe we should stay, we should stay afterwards. And certainly trying to win a referendum simply on the grounds that we want to keep Scotland inside the European Union divides the nationalist movement. So that's Nicola Sturgeon's essential problem. Meanwhile, along the way, she has not succeeded in, um, in, in, in persuading many a, a, a yes voter that perhaps holding a referendum relatively soon is that good an idea. I mean, we can speculate as to why, but she's, been, she's found it relatively difficult. Now, okay. 
Can you? I'll stop at that point. Stop, yeah. Okay. Thank right. you, John. Uh, that's a, a really. I hadn't realised that the division is a bit like the Labour thing. Yes. Even no, more no, starkly, no, which no, is no, very no, interesting. No, I, 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 I mean, the crucial uh, thing about Bra uh, Bra Bra don't say any more. Brexit, don't say any more. Brexit, so Brexit is disruptive. Brexit is disruptive. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Let's have some questions. Who would like? Got a few minutes. So who would like to begin? the questions. Uh, the lady there in the second row, there's a mic rushing towards you. Being very upset about um, the result, the, the, the Brexit result, I put in a freedom of information request to the Cabinet Office about the parameters of the referendum, had, had a threshold been discussed and had a supermajority as opposed to a simple majority been discussed. And I was turned down six times on the grounds that the information I was asking for, although I kept trying to narrow it down, would cost too much for the £600. So eventually I narrowed it down to what discussions were there between David Cameron and Oliver Letwin on these matters, and back came the answer, there were none. Mm. This question came up in the debate, in the 2015 debate, when Alex Salmon said also, should there not be a majority across all the dev devolved nations? And the answer was no, because for the purposes of um, foreign affairs, we are a single polity. If there were to be a second referendum, if there were to be, we would have to start all over again with the parameters of what that would be. Supposing one said it ought to be 66% or 60% or whatever. Given that the first referendums, that all the referenda we have had so far, have not been run on that basis, they have been simple majorities. No, 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 no. You, you know, you couldn't do that, could you? No, no, no. Could can, you? Can, can, can I, may, maybe I need to remind people in this audience that back in March 1979, we had a referendum in Scotland, a majority of people voted in favour of devolution, and you know what? That's largely gone down as a rather uh, unacceptable experience. And the truth is it just took another 18 years before eventually slightly more people voted in favour of devolution and Scotland now has its Scottish Parliament. There is a historical record on this, and I would say to people the difficulty... I mean, at the end of the day, the question of whether or not Scotland should or should not be in part of the United Kingdom is ultimately an issue of legitimacy. It's whether or not people north of the border are willing to accept rule from London. Equally, the question of whether or not the United Kingdom is a member of the European Union is a question of legitimacy. It's a question of whether or not we're willing to accept the pooling of sovereignty with the rest of the European Union. If there isn't public consent for those arrangements, it is very, very difficult to sustain them. And I think once you've got a po popular vote that's a, that says, up with this, no longer will we put, it's very difficult to carry on with it. OK, thank you. Let's take a, another question. By the way, Cameron was too scared. He, had a, he was so scared of his rebels um, of doing anything to make the referendum more palatable or easier for yeah. the Remain side. Yeah, the lady here in the second row, then we'll, we'll go back a bit. Um, Thank you all very much. And some of what you've been saying this afternoon, for me, um, was not known. So my question to you is, whose responsibility was it to make sure that the um, communities of the United Kingdom, the jurisdictions of the United Kingdom, had the accurate information upon which to vote in the referendum? Well, it was the no. government. Okay, Please, you, you go it go was the, it was, two brief answers. It no. was the government of the United Kingdom, which had the responsibility to make sure that everyone understood the parameters of the referendum, what the outcome and, uh, of the referendum, what it, what it entailed. And what I understand, I've seen something, I would ask everyone on this panel to correct me, I've seen that a referendum in this country is not binding. No, of course not. No. So what not. are we doing? No. So no, it's an advisory to, referendum. Yeah. Yeah. To your, it was advisory. The, 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 the AV referendum was the AV referendum was was wasn't, binding. Wasn't, was binding. The, the legislation was written in such a way yeah. that if a majority of people had voted in favour of the alternative vote, it would have been legislated for. And the EU referendum was John, advisory. John, can I say something quickly as well? So from my point of view, looking at it, what happened was that the H with the government, which is actually the Crown in Parliament, took this referendum and ran with it. And Gina Miller said, no, go to court and make sure that the Parliament of the People seals this deal. And that's what happened. So, the, and the big difference in the AV vote, I always say, AV vote was very simple. Are you for AV or not? If it's not, you know what we have already. It's AV, you know what you're going to get. 
And that's, you, uh, yeah. I would still not recommend having <laughs> yeah. referenda, yeah. Yeah. but it's simple. But there was yeah. a clarity about what would follow. Well, yeah, it's, but it's, sh it's, shall I say, cool. those who yeah. lost the AV referendum feel, uh, yeah. was, and some of the characters are exactly the same as in the EU referendum, feel that the public were misled <laughs> as much <laughs> over AV as they were over <laughs> the EU referendum. That's the tends to be the view of the losers. Misleading. Yeah. Now, here's a shocking thing. As a consumer brand, if I put out an advertisement and I make a claim that is not correct, even slightly not correct, the Advertising Standards Authority comes down on me like a ton of bricks and I have to withdraw that advertisement. Do you know the Advertising Standards Authority has no jurisdiction over an election? Yeah, sure. The Election Commission is toothless, useless. They have no say in anything, which is why that bus could go around with 350 million pounds, let's and give it to lie, the NHS. And lie, and lie. And by the way, it's in terms not, of information, four months, that's what the public were given, four months to learn about this hugely complex issue that we've been in for four decades. Yeah to make a decision forever for our generations after us. That is so irresponsible for anyone to do at all. Look at the figures again. By the way, the net spending to the EU every year is eight, between eight to 10 billion pounds, depending on how you calculate it. That is 1% of our annual government expenditure per year. If you draw a pie chart of our government expenditure, you have to draw a line and then point an arrow and say, that's our contribution to the EU. I would pay that money just for the peace and the security that we've yeah, had. But the, 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 problem, the problem is that for, that for your side of the argument was that uh, even 1% is 1% too sure, much for sure. those. That, you know. Sure, yeah. but okay. that, that, that's why so, it was so, the wrong yeah, argument. We've got time yeah, for yeah, yeah. one more question. Someone, oh, yeah, we've got the mic there. Uh, yeah. Well, just on the question of things being binding, to what extent is the triggering of Article 50 uh, binding? Okay. Uh, oh. And. Uh, what, well, that's the question. Right, we're going to extend this session for another hour and a half to uh, explore this one. Uh, John, uh, do, you, do you know the definitive answer? I, I, well, I think the answer is that there isn't a definitive answer, and, it, and, the, truth, <laughs> and, yeah. the, and the truth is it probably would require the European Court of Justice to adjudicate on the issue. But uh, I think uh, that certainly uh, Lord Kerr, who wrote the relevant article, does believe it's possible for a member state to rescind it. And I think the, yeah. at the end, the, in the end, the truth is it's a political answer. And if the European Union would, would prefer us not to leave, if they said, OK, fine, right, OK, you're back in, um, then I think probably it's all over. And if, and if David Cameron hadn't been engaged in playing games with his right flank in the Conservative Party, and he was an honest man and a decent man, what he would have done was hold a series of town halls around this country where we're sitting the way we are and we ask questions of the government, we bring up points of view, we get as informed as we want to, and then do what we need to do. But that never happened. And it was it, it is the most disastrous. And history, history will look at this and say, why in the hell was this a party political decision? Change this country. The final is word. This a, the final word. And in terms of party political, it's one part of one party. Yes, yes. And this party called UKIP, where are they now? Can I see UKIP? Where are 14% yeah. of the vote they had at one stage. Today, UKIP almost doesn't exist, and this Nigel Farage chap just ran away the moment he'd got liberty for this country, supposedly. This is, a, this is the third mistake we're making now, serious mistake as a country. The Iraq war was a serious mistake. Number two, the financial crisis was a serious mistake. And now this is the biggest blunder of them all, what we've done here. And the three reasons we've discussed immigration, it's a nonsense. The spending the, to the European Union, they're asking for 100 billion. Whatever it is, we're going to have to keep paying in, and I've said what the 8 billion is. And the final is the sovereignty. What loss of sovereignty? Our courts, I know in Parliament, the decisions that affect all of us on a day-to-day -day basis, 99% of them are made in our Parliament and in our devolved administrations that affect our day-to-day -day lives. So this is a nonsense when people wake up to it that the Brexit emperor has no clothes. And we will end up remaining. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, we've run out of time, I'm afraid. I've just got time. I've left time to say three things. One, my book, which has all the answers yeah. to all your questions. <laughs> the Rise of the Outsiders is on sale out there. Only a few left, so I, anyway, I could sign them. And also, at the end of the 
festival, I think, at 6.50, I'll be taking you behind the scenes, the crazy world of British politics and beyond, in the, uh, the marquee in the walled garden. But above all, I want to thank our wonderful panel and all of you. Thank and you do, very and do, much indeed. And do buy the New European, because there are long stretches, and you'll get all kinds of different articles on this point of view. Thank you.